So we're pleased to welcome our own Dr. Mark Hasegawa Johnson of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Dr. Hasegawa Johnson is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and uh, oh, I'm sorry, in, in, um, ECE, Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, his work has mostly has been includes um, work on automatic speech recognition, including models of prosody and uh, automatic. Um, a model of pre-conscious speech perception. So his talk today, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> so he'll be speaking to us today about his, some of his work on automatic speech recognition, I believe. So thank you, Dr. Mark, Dr. Hasegawa Johnson. So I'll be um, I'll be providing examples from from some of my own work um, and also some examples from work that's been recommended to me and, and that I found interesting. Oh, this podium is tilted, so you can't put a cup of coffee on it. Um, I guess I guess coffee. Um, but I want to I want to talk about. Well, I, I, one always has to find some kind of theme you know, around which to organize a talk of this kind and. Um, I've been thinking a lot about data recently because there's an interesting um, sea change happening in the field of language technology and speech technology in particular with regard to data and there are a lot of um, there are a lot of theoretical results that we don't have yet and then there are some interesting ones that we do have and and in thinking about data it, it, it starts to one, one starts to notice that actually technology is becoming more like linguistics, or at least it's becoming more like linguistics the way linguistics is becoming. Um, so I, I, when I talk about the convergence of linguistics and language technology, I'm going to kind of be organizing the talk in the, to a large extent around um, this thing called the scientific method that this guy named Bacon invented in the 1600s. Um, and and one, of the, one of the things that we can organize around the scientific method is, is we can talk about how one goes about uh, making scientific discoveries. One forms a hypothesis, and then one gathers data, and then and one observes the data and tries to figure out what what the data mean and and in in a sense there there are two halves of that there's the data and the models how many people in this audience there, there's this this um, neural networking package or, or machine learning package called Weka which is made available from this group in New Zealand how many people have actually have have uh, downloaded Weka so yeah it's it's uh, it's fairly well known. Um, there's 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 an interesting thing that that one starts to observe when one look, looks at data, especially when you're as old as I am. You you realize that those of us who are over 25 don't realize actually that language that language science and language technology are converging in their methods. And those who are under 25, who have been maybe at graduate students for less than three years, don't really realize that they were ever quite separate. Because for example, a model that you create a hypothesis around um, is just a function mapping from some set of variables to some other set of variables and the the interesting part is not necessarily the form of that function the interesting part is what are the variables right what are the things that what are the things that influence other things and um, data converse the the uh, the modifications that are happening to data I've kind of summarized glibly here in, in two ways what's happening to um, to language science I think I've summarized in terms of uh, Jennifer Cole's rapid prosody transcription, but you can summarize it effectively equally well by saying that that um, that laboratory phonology data is getting larger. Um, so, in, a f in 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 for those of you who are are younger than 25 and don't know this, um, um, for most of the language science and language technology were divided according to the following principle: um, language science uh, used small carefully tailored, carefully designed data sets that were designed specifically in order to demonstrate the truth or falseness of a, a falsity of a particular hypothesis. And, um, and language technology, on the other hand, used uh, huge machine learning algorithms that required huge data sets. And because huge data sets were expensive, um, those huge data sets were fairly generic. And what's happening, I think, to both fields is that we're converging. We have small, carefully tailored data sets, large generic data sets. Both fields are converging to large, carefully tailored data sets. Um, the, the change in technology, I think, in the, in the methods of technology is, is larger, I think, than the change in the methods of science because, in effect, um, we've realized that since data are relatively cheap now, that you don't need to build generic systems anymore. You can build a system which is carefully tailored to a particular application and therefore performs much better on that application. You can say, what are the variables that interact in the particular task that that this set of users wants to accomplish, and it becomes a lot more like a scientific hypothesis, and the data are designed 
or in, in manners that are a lot more similar to um, the ways in which linguistic data have always been designed. And, and the only difference between the, this new world and, and sort of the, the tradition of langu language science is that now rather than campus, we recruit on the internet, which means that you can multiply your scale by a factor of 10. Uh, so let me let me talk about some um, particular examples. Here's the scientific method um, published by this guy named Bacon in 1620. He said that you create a hypothesis that can be falsified. That's kind of important. And then you create an experiment to determine whether the hypothesis is true or false. And if the experiment doesn't falsify, you, you perform some analysis as necessary to figure out whether the experiment actually falsified the hypothesis or not. And if not, then you interpret that the hypothesis has some greater likelihood of being true than it did before. And the thing that, of course, we don't teach our middle schoolers when we, when we first teach them the scientific method is that, is that this is a loop. A hypothesis doesn't come out of thin air like, uh, like an artistic genius. It, it, it comes from the, the previous round of interpretation. This this cycle um, repeats once every once every three to twelve months in in the life of any individual investigator. Experiment in order to test a hypothesis, and then the outcomes of that experiment tell you new things about the world that in turn guide your selection of the next set of hypotheses. Um, there's an interesting parallel in, in engineering, in technology. There's this thing called the Schuhart cycle, sometimes called the Deming cycle, that was created by, um, that, was, that was popularized by J. Edwards Deming, in the, um, especially in the, in the post-World War II days, that, um, well, it's, it's um, summarized as PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. Um, what's interesting is that prior to the 20th century, um, engineering was about do, and there wasn't really much, um, I mean, there was there was plan to make sure it's successful, but the, the last two pieces weren't there. Um, what Schuhart said was that in order to in order to be able to check the degree to which you've succeeded, you need to have some measurements of, of the process of delivering. You're, you're delivering some capability to, to users. Um, you're, that's what engineers do some capability and we make it possible for for some people to use that capability and and if you're delivering that capability to users um, they say oh yeah it worked well that's not really good enough anymore you have to be able to measure the way in which it worked well and the degree to which it worked well um, and the, the different you know, hopefully the, the way in which it worked well along a few different dimensions and so you create a plan that allows you to both deliver that capability to users and to measure how well they um, how well it performed and then you check the, the degree to which your plan worked by performing um, statistical analyses uh, that are actually derived from from science, things like ANOVA and t-test um, and reg and regressions, um, and then you act, and the act is actually um, a modification of the plan. Um, what what Schuhart saw immediately, having building on um, his 300 years uh, um, uh, posterity to Francis Bacon, is that is that this is a cycle, and that um, the next plan comes from the previous actions. And a lot of um, a lot of the, the the fantastic innovations in engineering in the last half of the 20th century came by modifications of I, I think of this cycle um, either consciously or not consciously. For example, there's this thing called extreme programming, which is um, which became which upended software engineering in the 1990s, which basically says that the PDA, PDCA cycle should happen in a day. That Every day, you should have a plan for some functionality you're going to create and deliver to a user. The user should be in the next cubicle over, or you know, or so should be somebody that you can consult with quickly. You implement that plan, you deliver it to the user, you measure how well it performed using um, test code, um, and then you and then you act to, to to decide what you should change the next day. Um, there's this thing called user-centered design that the NSF has been um, has been pushing very strongly for the past 20 years. There's a there's a um, there's a, a division within IIS called human-centered computing. I think they recently finally changed their name, but that basically says that that the um, that that this PDCA cycle should be arranged around the processes of people performing actions and that one way to do that is to have the people who are going to perform those actions giving you the content of each step of this process. Um, the, the users sit around and talk about what they would like to be in the plan and then the experts figure out how to put it there. And then the users, um, uh, the, the experts give them the device and then the users um, uh, figure out whether it's doing what's in the plan and then the users tell you what should be in the check, what should you actually be checking for and then you find out whether it's, whether it's there or not. And then the users tell you what should be in the action, what, what things are uh, um, given, to, if, if an expert goes off and performs a statistical analysis and, and gives it back to the users, then the users say, oh, well that looks pretty good but this part over here is completely irrelevant, I don't care. Right? So, so a lot of 
specifications are sort of built around this cycle, which is basically this cycle, right? They're not they're not actually that different. Um, what I want to talk about is uh, for for those who are under the age of 25, what sort of some some examples that I really like about um, from from the history of language science and language technology. So um, laboratory phonology in the laboratory is um, is the scientific method. We have some set of variables that we think um, we some have uh, a set of we have a, a dependent variable that we believe to be correlated with certain independent variables and we believe it to be uncorrelated with other independent variables. And so we create a task that involves um, speakers or listeners or writers or readers of those of those groups and, uh, in which we manipulate the independent variables and measure the result on the de dependent variables. Right? Um, so here's an example that, that I really like. This is a, a study that was published by Leigh Lisker in 1975 in the Journal of the Acoustic Society. Um, at the time, there was um, there was some some debate between sort of the the Delatra, Lieberman, and Cooper camp and the uh, and the um, Miller and Nicely camp, I guess, or the Stevens Bloomstein camp, in terms of um, what what is the cue for voicing of of stop consonants? Um, is it the the space and and two two uh, uh, so Lisker boiled this down to two possibilities. He said um, the two things that have been proposed as the cue are the frequency of F1 at, at, at voice onset. That is to say, if you wait a certain time after the release of the stop, um, F1 rises into the vowel, and if F1 is high enough, then people hear this as an unvoiced stop, and if F1 is low enough at voice, as a voiced stop. Um, conversely, there's this voice onset time, which requires listeners to actually hear the burst. There was some and uh, there was some uncertainty at that point whether listeners really could hear bursts or not. So, um, so he created stimuli of this kind. Um, is there a mic I can carry so I can? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, he created stimuli of this kind where there's a little, just a, a little very synthetic burst. This is still um, pattern playback, but there's a little, a little K burst here at, uh, at uh, 1.4 kilohertz. And then sometime later, this, this time is the VOT, the, uh, um, the uh, abscissa in these plots, some, sometime later all of the formants would, would come on with, with regular voiced activation. And they would come on either in um, a really standard uh, uh, velar stop release where you have a rising F1, a falling F2, and a rising F3, or they would come on with one of these two artificial modifications, B or C. B is modified to sound more unvoiced by having an F1 that starts higher. It starts close to the vowel and it stays there. And C is, doesn't really sound like anything. It, doesn't, it changes the vowel, actually, by, by bringing F1 all the way down here to where F1 would be if, um, if you were releasing, if, if you had a, a voiced, right, if you had a voiced onset with a very short voice onset time, then you start F1 at this point, and so we keep it here in, in, in version C. And, um, and each, each corner on each of these lines well, on this line in particular, each corner on each of these three curves on this line is 44 subjects who listened to um, listened to the, uh, the the stimulus and said whether it was a, a G or a K, right? Um, ga or Ka, um, and you can the, the results are are self-evident. What you what you find is that um, I mean when when you perform the experiment and then perform the analysis by plotting them out this way. Um, voice onset time dominates the response curve. If the voice onset time is larger, so people are listening to the burst is what that means. Um, if the voice onset time is long, people hear it as a K. If the voice onset time is short, people hear it as a G. But F1 is not irrelevant. Um, raising, F, uh, raising F1 to... So the, this is, sorry, this is not coming out well. Ray, the, the, this and this are different kinds of lines. This is supposed to be dotted, and this one is supposed to be dashed. So um, um, raising F1 tends to push the, uh, the responses to, to, to the, the, the percentage K judgments to slightly higher VOT, and lowering F, no, the other way around. Raising F1 pushes the, if you make it sound more like an unvoiced stop then people are more willing to respond voiced yeah raising f1 pushes the pushes the, uh, the the percentage k judgments to a lower vot makes people more likely to hear it as k lowering f1 has a small effect in the opposite direction it tends to reduce the number of people who are willing to call it a k but but these are relatively these are statistically significant effects but they're relatively small compared to the um, the vot effect uh, so this was a you know 
this is what you what you might call a, a, a well-designed laboratory phenology study. He set out, he, he took this ambiguity that existed in the literature and he boiled it down to an either-or choice. It's one of these two cues. And then he created a set of stimuli that, um, that could answer, that, that could uh, determine which of those two cues was, um, was decisive and the degree to which the other one had any influence at all. And, and then he played it to subjects and had them listen. Um, language technology, actually, this has been, it's kind of, you know, well, anyway, this is, this is, this is, I'm going to present sort of a, a, a meta summary that's been compiled by people at NIST. Um, so the, the language technology in the 20th century was driven by, originally by DARPA and later on by other government agencies, including NIST, the National Institute of Standards. And the general idea is that um, starting in starting in the early 1990s, we with the uh, with the um, the TI Digits Corpus and, and Timit, and then moving on to Resource Management Corpus, which had a small vocabulary, and then to the Wall Street Journal, which ha which had a large vocabulary but was carefully read speech, and then to Broadcast News, which is less carefully read, and and Switchboard, which is completely spontaneous, and the room speech, which is um, lots of people talking over one another spontaneously. We identify a style of speech for which speech recognition still fails. In each of those cases, we identify a new genre. And, and genre is, is as, you, as you know, a loosely defined term. But we identify a new genre for which speech recognition still fails. And then the DOD or NIST uh, funds a huge data collection effort to get hundreds or thousands of hours of speech labeled in that genre. And then, um, and then you have eight articles by 44 universities. You have a, 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 a lot of us get, go, jump in and, and use this new data to create new algorithms, um, sometimes small modifications of existing algorithms, and then later on um, sometimes uh, uh, algorithms that would not have been possible with um, previously existing data. And um, the, 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 the cynical description is that, um, is that as soon as the government start, puts money into the project, um, Engineers working on this project reduce the error rate uh, logarithmically, exponentially, at 10 to 20 percent per year. So this red line is is the switchboard line, and you can see that the switchboard error rate started out pretty close to 100 percent back in 19, back in 1993, I guess. And then it it notice that this is a logarithmic scale over here, right? The the word error rate. Um, drops at about 20 percent per year, all the way through switchboard and all the way through broadcast speech. Um, and so that wasn't difficult enough, so we brought in, um, well, non-English speech has, has not decreased as fast because we don't have as large, the, the databases are not as large. Meeting room speech actually seems to violate the rule. Over here we have uh, carefully read speech like the, uh, um, the air, sorry, air travel information system which was simulated and um, somewhere over there should be Wall Street Journal and the Resource Management Corpus. Is which um, th those lines dropped really fast. The switchboard dropped about 20 percent per year. The meeting room speech seems to be uh, um, seems to seems to violate the principle. The error rates just don't go down, and I think there that's they go down a little bit here for this particular corpus. But um, I think that's because there are other things going on besides just identification of phonemes, and we haven't figured out what else. Um, I mean, there are other things going on like identification of overlap and removal of, of reverberation that we haven't solved yet. All right. Um, so that's the that's 1988 through 2010, and um, some big things happened in the late 2000s, in um, 2005 and 2010, that have dramatically changed the way in which language technology is produced, and uh, starting to change um, the scale at which linguistics can be conducted. Uh, so. Um, Working backwards, starting with models and working our way backward to task, I guess the, the, the redefinition of what is a model is something that affects language science perhaps more than language technology, but it comes from um, the, the fact that we've solved the machine learning problem. I don't know if this has been announced to this audience or not. Dan Roth announced this in a talk at, at Beckman uh, three years ago, and, and I didn't think that he knew what he was talking about, and having researched it more, I kind of do. The, the supervised learning problem where you have a set of unlabeled, you have a set of a set of data and then you have labels for each of the tokens in that in that data set has been solved in the sense that we have um, tight theoretical bounds on exactly what percentage error you can get with how many labels. Um, and those tight theoretical bounds, they're, they're tight in the sense that 
we actually have algorithms that can achieve those bounds in many cases, things like the support vector machine. And um, with larger databases where the SVM doesn't work well, we can use neural nets actually to, uh, to achieve bounds comparable to that. Um, there are, if you're, if you're interested in machine learning, don't despair. There are unsolved problems, but that particular problem is pretty much solved, which is good news for those of you who are interested in language science because it means that you can use it as a black box. You can go and download Wika and you can say, I want to demonstrate that variable y is independent of variable x2. I want to determine the degree to which variable y is independent of x2 given x1. And you can then collect the required data and then um, and then download Wika and, and test it. You can, you can train a model um, f of x1 comma x2 to predict y, and you can train another model f of x1 to predict You can compare the two to, to, um, to see what the difference in performance is. And it doesn't really matter that they're not linear. It doesn't really matter that they're not categorical. Um, there, are, there, are, um, there are functional, some, some kind of parametric functional model available, and you can actually... Um, you can, you can look up how well the accuracy should perform with a certain amount of training data in order to estimate. That, that's not, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, of course. Um, the more complicated the relationship, the more data you need. Um, but um, if, you have enough, if you have enough data in order to, to model a complicated relationship, then it really boils down to f of x1 versus f of x1 comma x2. So that's, that's kind of nice. That means that um, that boils out the problem of figuring out what the form of the relationship is. It, it says that the real core scientific question, what are the variables that relate, is now, is now um, easier to address head-on. Right? Um, and getting a large enough data set to learn an arbitrary function is a whole lot easier. Um, I'm going to talk about actually um, a whole variety of techniques. Crowdsourcing is the one that I, that I allude to, uh, both with the um, rapid prosodic transcription I would call a kind of crowdsourcing and with Mechanical Turk, but there's actually a whole suite of, of learning methods that are still um, open unsolved questions in machine learning that are um, that, uh, for which we have some bounds but not great and, and I want to talk about some of those. Um, and then um, finally, the thing that has um, part um, language technology is, the, is that word genre that I kind of um, put up on the screen without defining very carefully before. Um, so, for example, in NIST competitions, typically they'll do things like give you a news database or give you a database of scientific articles or a database of, of blog postings or something like that. And that's fine if your goal is to take that database of scientific articles and determine which ones are chemistry and which ones are biology. And that's actually what those databases tend to be used for. But if your goal is to actually parse the sentence and understand um, which of the nouns in that sentence takes which, other, takes which other nouns in which semantic relationship or something fairly complicated like that, then you quickly discover that articles about ultrasound are not the same as articles about MRI. They have completely different vocabularies. They're written by different people who often have different L1s. Right? Um, they're, they're, um, they're published in different journals according to different standards of content and different standards of syntax. And so, um, and so just be, you know, this, this word genre is kind of misleading. We can say, well, scientific articles are a genre. Um, well, maybe biomedical imaging articles are a genre. Well, actually, no, because um, the, within biomedical imaging, you have a whole bunch of different, um, different authors publishing in different ways. Um, uh, speech, right? Broadcast news is a genre. Actually, this is this is a place where um, where I think the the text people are ahead of the speech people, the the, the natural language processing people. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues in the Department of Computer Science sent me an email yesterday to ask if the LDC has released any uh, news corpus that contains news text from 2013. This is the most specific such request I've ever I've ever heard yet. I told him I I didn't think so yet, but I would I would check for him, and I haven't gotten around to checking. But um, because they realize that, I mean, the, the news events in 2012 were things like the Summer Olympics in London and the election re-election of Barack Obama. Um, the news events in, in 2013 were things like the um, the the coup that deposed um, Mohamed Morsi, um, and. I mean, 2013 was the year in which Al Jazeera began broadcasting an English language channel, right? Um, 2014, the big news, the, the big news outlet is the one that's you know is, is Russia Today, right? I mean, um, well, depending on depending on whether or not you like to listen to what your enemies are saying, if if that. I don't know. Can I say um, the, the big the big the big news is the big news is going on in a different part of the world from where it was going on in 2013, right? 
And with the result that the vocabulary is different, um, the L1s of the people writing the text is often different, the syntax with which they, with which they write is often different, and the, um, the, uh, under the, the, the semantic nuance of a particular, of, a, of the same noun might be completely different depending on which year you're looking at. So if a genre is one year of news, spending hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire a news corpus is just not feasible at that scale. And fortunately, we don't have to. I guess um, the closest I can come to providing a personal example is our work on, on automatic prosody transcription. Um, we, we, spent, we started with the Boston Radio Speech Corpus in, in uh, the Boston Radio News Corpus, which is a collection of um, NPR broadcasts from the early 1990s, 1990 through 1992, um, broadcast um, broadcast primarily by announcers who were native to the to the to New England and the Boston area and transcribed in Boston it's seven talkers seven and a half hours of data it's um non uniformly distributed one of the talkers uh, speaks for three of those hours and and the other um, the other six talk for the other three hours um, it's a, it's a fairly large it's it's a small corpus by audio recognition standards. It's not large enough to train um, even triphone models, but it's it's the largest available prosodically transcribed corpus. Um, it's marked with the Toby system for, for tones and break indices. Um, all that what what we did was boil that down to a to a, uh, an easily solvable problem, which was ident the identification of which words have a pitch accent and which words are intonational phrase final. Right? And then there, and then Switchboard is a much larger automatic speech recognition corpus. It's 300 hours of data with about a thousand talkers of conversational telephone speech. Um, this is this is where the the word genre starts to break down. Um, NIST wanted to work on conversational telephone speech, and so what they did was they they created an automatic agent that had people call in, and then they would connect any two volunteers in a in a conversation and give them a topic to talk about. And as a result. Um, this genre is less the genre of conversational telephone speech than it is the genre of, um, of forced conversational telephone speech about a topic that interests neither of the participants. Um, and so, if, so um, if you train, for example, if you train a recognizer on this database and then try to apply it to the call home corpus, which is a corpus of people who have um, volunteered to have their conversations, to have their telephone con uh, calls home um, recorded by NIST in, in exchange for a free phone call. Um, you get no comp, you, the, the accuracy of a recognizer trained on this when applied to call home is almost zero um, because people talk very differently to their families than they talk to strangers even even in the same language. Anyway, so we, we had um, so we had about 1,700 words of this corpus transcribed with full prosodic transcription with Toby, tones and break indices. And um, here are the results for pitch accent detection error rates. These are actually not so bad, I guess. The, um, the first set over here is just the chance error rate, just showing that 45% uh, that of the words in radio speech have a pitch accent, whereas only 32% of the words in, in, con in, in switchboard have a pitch accent. Um, the the automatic detection error rates um, if we don't know the words we actually don't do so well but if we know the words we get um, if we use uh, the recognized words we're getting 20 percent if we use the the known words we're getting 17 percent error rate in the radio speech corpus and so we get a hit of well I guess that comes to about about a quarter we the error rate incre increases by about a quarter if we try to apply the same system trained on radio speech to to switchboard um, and then it's even worse, actually, for, for phrase detection. Uh, so the, uh, the, number of, the number of words that have a phrase boundary following them is about 16% in radio speech and uh, about 23% in, in switchboard. If we try to apply the recognizer, the recognizer does, I mean, it looks worse because the recognizer does really well in radio speech. It's really easy to detect an intonational phrase boundary when you have a radio announcer who is specifically trying to parse their sentences so that every listener can understand them. So we get about a 6% error rate on that task. But then if you apply the same recognizer to switchboard, you get a more than double the error because um, radio speech prosody is not the same as conversational prosody. Um, and we didn't, I mean, the obvious solution, so the, the, the 1990s solution um, would have been to, oh, really? <laughs> oh, no. Um, the 1990s solution would have been to acquire a big corpus and, and to train it uh, to perform the switchboard task, but, um, but we weren't NIST, so we didn't have that much money. Um, all right.
Um, so, right, I'm going to organize the, the second chunk of the talk, the second half of the talk, theoretically, um, around, around the scientific method, around sort of things that, things that one can do if one w wishes to perform large, uh, large corpus language science or um, boutique uh, tailor-made large corpus um, language technology. Um, one creates a, a hypothesis which, as I said, d determines which variables interact. So, um, so for example, um, an example of something that can go wrong, I guess, is, is um, our, our experiment with e-diary physical fitness data. We had, um, we, uh, we got 20 subjects to once, once every half an hour for a week, um, turn on their digital audio recorder and answer the question, what are you doing now? The idea was to automatically rate the physical, act to develop a system that would automatically rate the physical activity of participants. So it's a fairly large corpus by sheer numbers, it's 15,000 um, utterances that were transcribed both manually and automatically, and where we ran into trouble was that um, we used um, we we just adopted an existing physical activity ontology. Coders went through and took um, this this hierarchical ontology of physical activity that's used by the kinesiology department and labeled um, each of those utterances with one of these categories. And we also had um, information about the metabolic equivalent task hour, uh, a real number, and. Um, the result was a fairly high error rate, actually, 20%, uh, um, despite the large data. In fact, an interesting thing happens. The, the manual transcriptions have a lower class error rate, but a higher um, uh, error for the uh, metabolic uh, uh, ta task equivalent than the automatic transcriptions. The automatic transcriptions don't get the class as well, but it doesn't seem to matter if what you're really trying to do is to determine how physically active the person is. And part of the reason is that of those 612 class labelers, the labeler used 138 of them. And of those 100, 138, a lot of them were used inconsistently by different labelers, right? So they would, they would use entirely different sets of words to describe the activity of interest. They might have similar MET scores. In fact, the most frequent labels were sleeping, eating, sitting, typing, things like that. Um, and, and so for one thing that we did that worked was to reduce the SVM from uh, the 1640, the 1,600 unique words that were used in the corpus to only the 500 most frequent. And that um, slightly but non-significantly improved the error rate. Um, and then, okay, so in order to, then I want to talk about how to acquire data and how to label data. Um, so an example of label that you find, the, the, the first thing that we think of when we, when we go into finding label at, on a large scale is to go out and look for it on the web, and this works if you have a task for, that people are already doing on the web. For example, people post music and speech on the web. And so this is a, a database that um, we created for mixed stereo audio classification. The idea was to use the fact that that music has differences between the left and right channel, whereas speech doesn't, in order to determine the, the ratio of the speech energy to the music energy in any given signal. And the problem was that no corpus released by the U.S. government, um, you know, none of the NIST standard corpora has both the left and right channels, because they were all released for speech recognition, which assumes um, monaural, on monaural audio. So what Austin did was to go out and, and just download lots of audio clips. And then um, reviewers didn't like that. They said you you can't just you can't make your work not reproducible in this way. And and so what reviewers have been satisfied with is for us to publish exactly which audio clips those were, making this potentially a a, a database that other people can use for the same task, if if people want to go out to the same websites and download the same audio. Um, the, 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 the Wizard of Oz methods of the 1990s are, are being extended to the internet. This is something that, to my knowledge, we haven't done really well yet here at Illinois. So here's an example from Berkeley. Um, this is a task called, the, called Scribe for Me. Um, what they did for this experiment was, um, for two weeks, subjects carried around um, a cell phone app that um, whenever they pressed the button, it would send the most recent 30 seconds of audio from, uh, that were recorded by that device um, to uh, a, a person who was sitting in a room somewhere for eight hours a day for those two weeks, listening, uh, um, wait, waiting for people to to send them audio, and that person would write write down what seemed, sorry, would write down what seemed to be happening. Okay, it would write down what seemed to be happening. For example, if you're in the the, the shopping market, move your items to the bag, please. Thank you for shopping at Safeway. Um, and then finally, here's an example of. Um, 
So if, if found on the world web is only good for some tasks, and if wizard on the web take, requires you to develop something, um, for some tasks it may be possible to just look around you and find things that people are doing about which you could ask questions, and this is something that uh, Chi Lin did. Um, she was teaching Chinese language classes and discovered that um, that one could learn a lot by asking the the students whether or not it's okay to record them while they give their while they give their 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 Chinese language debates and so um, and so uh, uh, Chen Wei Hu Chen Wei Wu uh, and and Chi Lin Shi uh, recorded this data had it transcribed um, by by um, linguistic students in Taiwan and then. Um, we, um, we've developed uh, automatic fluency um, annotation systems using these data. And then the last chunk of the talk is to talk about different ways in which one can label data. Um, so, so far I've largely been talking about crowdsourcing in which the question of interest is do labeler errors matter? But there are different ways in which one can use unlabeled or um, previously existing corpora Transfer learning is the task of, of taking an existing corpus and learning a model from that corpus that then might be adapted to the task that you care about. Semi-supervised learning actually works less well than I expected it to, where we, we train the model first without any labels at all, using the best criterion we can, and then adapt it using the labeled data. But active learning seems to have some promise for using the unlabeled data more effectively. So let me talk about those things. Here's um, Amit's uh, um, um, uh, re results recently on the task of adapting an English language speech recognizer to Turkish. Um, they have different phone systems. In fact, if you look at just the IPA labels, there are only four overlapping vowels between them. I was surprised by that, but the, the um, exact placement in the vowel space of the vowels of English and Turkish is quite different. But if you construct a um, the best possible mapping based on sort of uh, um, distinctive feature distance, you, can, you get this bootstrap recognizer, which is an English language recognizer whose models have just been relabeled as Turkish phones. And, um, and in fact that does, so here's the number of hours of, of Turkish data that were used in addition to a very large um, uh, English language corpus to, to train the, uh, am I, is that sentences, not hours? Sentences, not ours. I'm sorry. Um, the number of sentences of Turkish data that were used in addition to a large English corpus to train the recognizer. And um, in, in the, if we have just 500 sentences of Turkish data, we actually get the, the, same, the same recognition accuracy as the, the best possible recognition accuracy that you can get by training um, directly on the, on the Turkish. Um, so the, the Turkish corpus is not large enough to get 98% accuracy, but um, it's large enough to get a recognizer that works with 48% accuracy, and you can do that even by adapting from the English. Um, so how much data do you need? Um, it, we, we can more than have the, 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 uh, the data size in domain, but we need a large amount of out-of-domain uh, out data, which brings up the question of how useful unlabeled data can be. Um, since I'm running out of time, let me just skip over this and say that the uh, the utility of the unlabeled data is sig statistically significant but small. It's reduced the error rate by about six percent. Um, and so we and so one thing we might ask is, can the unlabeled data be used more uh, more wisely? Um, there's a method called active learning that was proposed by by Cohn, Atlas, and Ladner in 1994, um, which which uses the following intuition: if your goal is to determine on this line, where are the two thresholds between class one and class zero? Um, if you do this without feedback from the learning algorithm and you want to get 1% error, uh, error in your placement of each of those thresholds, then you need at least 100, uh, 100 examples to be labeled by your labelers. You, give, you, you divide this line into 100 equal size segments and ask, ask your labelers, is this, is this value, is this number, should this be in class one or class zero? On the other hand, if you have feedback from your learning algorithm to your labelers, you can give them this point, 0 0.5, and say, is that in class 1 or class 0? And they say, oh, that's in class 1. Then you know that you have a boundary somewhere to the left and a boundary somewhere to the right. So then you give them point, 0 0.25 and ask, is this in class 1 or class 0? And, and so on. And in that way, you turn an order of n task into order of log n. Um, the, to get a particular accuracy, the number of labelers that you need is, is, um, is um, logarithmic in the accuracy rather than linear in the accuracy, which is potentially a huge improvement. Um, and then finally, let me talk about crowd.
that um, I'm using as an example the, the, the technique of rapid prosody transcription developed by Jennifer Cole, Yoon Suk Mo, and, um, and Tim Mart. This is the LMEDS application in Hindi. The only, um, the only screenshot that I had available to me while writing these slides was in Hindi. And so here it is for um, subjects click on the, the words that sound prominent to them and they um, click on the boundaries that sound like sound like boundaries to them as they as they listen and this is a task that can be performed by by naive subjects um, who are not even in the same room with you there are theoretical bounds on how how much um, how many labels you need if you have a, an error if your labelers are making mistakes um, how many more labelers do you need right now the best bound is 1 over 1 minus 2 P quantity squared which is I think not great I'm, I believe we can do better but but it's still not too bad if you, if your if your labelers are making mistakes a quarter of the time, then you need maybe four times as many labels. Um, and then finally, a question that we're just starting to look at is this thing that I'm calling mismatched crowdsourcing, which is the question if coders have the right native language but they just don't have the expertise that you need, can you construct a method that will nevertheless get useful data from them? Or if coders are listening to a language that they don't speak. Can you nevertheless get useful information by um, uh, from from uh, by by from the labels pr produced by such coders? So here's kind of an example. Um, this is um, uh, Preeti Jyoti's uh, work, uh, speech prosody paper, and this is a, a th these these numbers are kappa scores, agreement between these four different labeling conditions. So these are relatively complicated plots. On the left are people labeling the pr the prominences of Hindi. On the right are people labeling the phrase, intonational phrase boundaries of Hindi. And when I say people labeling, the, the cloud of listeners is a cloud of, of um, linguistically naive Hindi speakers. They're, they're native speakers of Hindi, um, but they don't have any linguistic training. The Autobi system is our, our English language listener. In fact, this is an automatic system trained only using English data. It doesn't know anything about Hindi. And it's going through and labeling this, this Hindi speech for prominence and boundary as if it was English without paying any attention to the language. And then the expert is sort of the best, best of all worlds. The expert is a person who, spe who speaks um, Hindi natively and English almost natively and, and is, is a trained phonetician. And um, it's interestingly, the listeners agree with the Autobi and the expert system relatively, relatively well for phrase boundaries, but not at all for prominence. Um, this actually matches pretty well the descriptions in the literature that say that Hindi has intonational phrases but doesn't have um, uh, lexic do doesn't have um, phrasal prominence, doesn't have pitch accent on words. So when we ask listeners which word is prominent, they actually don't follow any of the same rules that a, a system trained on English or a linguistically trained expert would follow in trying to determine what you mean by the prominence of a word. Um, all right, I think I've actually already said these, so let me just go to the conclusion. Um, just in, I, 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 I adopted the word just in time, of course, from a manufacturing process that was developed in, in Japan in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and and th this, this sentence was on Wikipedia. I, I like this sentence a lot. The philosophy is simple. The storage of unused inventory is a waste of resources. And in our case, the generation of unused data is a, is a waste of resources. If you can get by with log n data and you generate n data, then um, then your experiment takes um, it takes a lot longer than it needs to take, and so the the trick is to figure out how to how to um, how to generate those resources. Um, so this is I think I mean forming a good scientific hypothesis has always been difficult. That hasn't really changed. Actually, it's become simpler because you don't have to worry as much about the form of the interaction. It's now um, almost sufficient to worry about the um, what is the interaction that you want to test. Um, you need to worry about the form in order to help you decide how much data to acquire in order to, to train Wika to learn that form. Um, the, the, hard, the, the new hard things are how do you acquire that quantity of data and here are a couple of questions you can ask. Who's already doing what you want to study or um, is it possible to create a relatively simple HTML form that will um, that will um, act as a Wizard of Oz for you, so that you can put a human listener on one end and a and a human user on the other end. Um, and then there's a lot of um, unsolved, a lot of solved problems, and a lot of unsolved problems in terms of labeling. Um, so we actually have pretty good. We actually have reasonable bounds for for how many labelers you need for crowdsourcing. We 
don't have very good, uh, very convincing bounds for SSL and active learning, but the bounds that we have already are quite are are, are make it worth worth trying to do. So trying to find a way to do active learning seems like a good thing. All right, and that's that's it. We have about 15 minutes for questions. I don't know if you want to do questions yourself sure. or um, have us sort of wrangle it. Um, we do ask that you speak into a microphone when you ask a question just so that we can include your question on the live stream. Oh. Thank you. Interesting talk. Um, I'm just. Um, interested in the findings about Hindi. <clears throat> One of the things which people have remarked about Hindi, of course, is that it has a low high melody Yes, on, on a pitch accent. And um, I found that in various contexts there are pretty robust effects of prominence um, and uh, finality, interaction of these, which suggests that there is maybe prominence there. So me, uh, the question hmm. which I have is, to what extent is the problem not that uh, that of Hindi, but rather of the labels which are applied to Hindi, yeah. and which may be looking for the wrong cues? Yeah, I, that's. I think that's exactly the the, the issue. Uh, the the an English language system assumes that prominence is independent. So Hindi has this low high melody, which um, if I I don't speak Hindi, but to my, to my understanding, occurs on every content word. Essentially, that it's it's a fairly frequent melody, which is then um, which is then modified at phrase boundaries, uh, as I understand. So the phrase boundaries are are fairly robustly detected. Um, in English, the location of the prominence is somewhat dissociated from the location of the phrase boundary, and so you can you can have and and um, and my understanding is that. Um, there's no simple definition according to which that's true in Hindi. Uh, each content word has this melody, and then there's um, additional marking of the phrase boundaries. Yeah, the, the thing is that there are uh, interactions at the end of an utterance, um, insofar as um, there are a number of cases where you have supposed free word order, but the word order plays out such that you get uh, a declination prosodic declination, hmm. uh, which clearly operates on something uh, having to do with prominence, uh, prosodic hmm. prominence, but uh, you know it operates, of course, within the framework of the low high melody and, and all, the, all the other things. Hmm. So, um, so you know, there, there are there are things to test, um, maybe of that sort, which might help you uh, refine um, the parameters that you might apply to analyzing things. Mm -hmm. It's. I should also point out that it's not true that we got um, no results by trying to detect prominence in Hindi. There's there's something there that even the English language Autobi system is picking up. So I presume what it's picking up are, are larger energy and larger F0 excursions on some words. And exactly which words those are, I'm not sure yet. One more question. Uh, so I think data is, is a, a huge thing. Obviously, big data is kind of becoming more of a thing uh, in data analytics for big companies. And so there's a huge amount available on the internet, um, just online, wherever it may be. Uh, I think the textual natural language processors have it kind of easy because everything's more or less uh, labeled them. They have tools that you know reach 96% accuracy or almost uh, achieving the, the human ability. Uh, and so they move on to other tasks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so so with the speech, it, it's certainly much more difficult because you know if we're if we're using uh, certain models, we need a labeled set. How do you view or or do you have a view on on where? Uh, the technology will start to move in terms of accessing the amount of data and and not just focusing on these small sets that 
need to be labeled very accurately and kind of reduce the scope of what's available uh, as opposed to you know the possibilities that are out there. Um, so what what I see happening is we I mean we have um, no nobody can match the department the U.S. Department of Defense for for uh, acquiring large labeled databases right um, we have um, we have several huge databases especially in English um, and it's it's interesting to see how the the languages in which speech recognition work well um, follow the follow the the um, the the rank order of of per capita GDP of the of the countries of the world, um, so Japanese, Dutch, you know, and and so on. Um, the uh, um, those corpora, as I as I've as I've tried to to say, uh, um, tend to be for particular versions of a of a fairly generic task like conversational telephone speech, meaning co conversations between strangers who are talking about a topic they don't really care about. Um, and and what I see happening in speech and language technology now is um, there's there are, there are really interesting methods in the past four or five years for making use of much larger databases the the um, the, the deep networks um, the deep neural networks that um, that uh, have received about uh, ninety percent of, of speech recognition um, uh, papers in the, in the past two ICASPs um, are are basically methods for for learning a lot more from very very large databases than people were able to do before but the other thing that I think is happening um, especially in the past five years and I think will can will continue to happen is is methods for um, taking that that tremendous improved performance on on the very large corpus and making use of it for very small corpora um, if you have a, a you, um, right, so let me let's see if I can go back several slides to the the NIST. Um, I mean, there's there's a, a lot of ways in which this can be in in which this can be described, but maybe the the most stark is the difference between languages, right? Here's here's um, performance on broadcast speech in English, and um, Here's Mandarin broadcast news, right? And that that gap still exists, despite the fact that Mandarin is is one of the two or three languages with the second largest um, labeled corpora in the world, right? Um, but suppose we could train acoustic models in English and use them in some way together with all of this Mandarin data to improve the quality of this Mandarin data by um, by learning something about the ways in which um, the the uh, the dynamics of, of of spectra over over speech, or by learning something about um, the the, um, the distinctions that matter perceptually to English listeners, and maybe some of those distinctions um, also matter to Mandarin listeners. Some of them don't, and the the, the field of transfer learning is sort of this uh, this this question of um, can you identify which of those which of those things you've learned from English. Um, can be can improve your your error rate in in Mandarin and can and which of them don't. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, then we can thank you, Dr. Hasegawa Johnson. Thanks. And for now, until the next session starts, we have